takes effort. And then we moved on to prayer. Because if prayer is really, really going to become powerful, then we back it with fasting. What is so important about fasting? Fasting reveals to God the earnestness and the nature of our heart. And the fact that this is what we want to see God move in. It is something that means something to us. And it shows God how important it is because we're willing to sacrifice of ourselves. If it's one thing that people don't like to do, they love to do things when it's convenient. But is it easy to subdue the flesh? Is it easy to subdue our own will? To push it down to the point where God, we say, God, not of me, but of you. When we fast, we show God that we are serious about getting a hold of him. To the point where we're really willing to sacrifice ourselves. Sacrifice that steak, sacrifice those cookies. And get ourselves lost in a place of prayer. If we ever fast without coupling it with prayer, it is nothing but a diet. That is all it is. But fasting and prayer goes hand in hand. We can look, we look at examples throughout history. We look, talk about John Knox, who married the Queen of Scots, took notice to him to the point where she said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in England. Why would she fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in England? Probably because they were coupled with prayer. You do not get a powerful prayer life without coupling it with fasting at some point. Without subduing the flesh. If we are ever going to fast and be successful, we do not, then in those times when we get hungry, we need to find ourselves shut in with God and replace it with prayer and fasting. We talked about Peter, how when people would lay out their sick, waiting for his shadow to come by. How did that happen with Peter? Was it just because of his prayer life? I highly doubt. More than likely, it was because of his fasting life as well. He became a Pentecostal powerhouse because he had the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence speaking on the tongues. He prayed and he fasted. How do we know that the early church knew what it was to set themselves aside and really get a hold of God? Well, in the early book of Acts, we know that they prayed. And they prayed so much that the house was shaken. God answered because they were sacrificing themselves to hear from God. So what do we do during a fast? Do we make our fast known unto men? No. We keep it private. Will there ever be a time when we do reveal that we're on a fast, man? Sometimes. In fact, it wouldn't hurt, I know they say for safety reasons, if you're going to fast, just tell one individual. That way if something were to happen, say you fainted and they didn't know why, they, if the paramedics or somebody would be called, then they would know why. They would be able to treat you quicker. Also, there might be times that it's unescapable. I remember when I was a teenager, early 20s, I was fasting. And we went up to Sister Dietrich's because that's the group I hung around with. We ran around together. When you went to the Sister the Dietrich's, of course, they were always saying, there's food in the fridge, help yourself. You gotta try some, or Brother Dietrich, you gotta try some of this butt. You gotta try some of this deer meat. And Sister Dietrich kept offering me food enough then to the point I said, Thank you, but I'm fat. No, I didn't realize. That's fine. Sometimes it's unavoidable. But a fast is not to be made public. If we had an LED sign, we don't fast, um, advertise out here that today um, Sister Stacy is fasting, today Brother um, Dennis is fasting. It's not something that we make known to everybody. Why? Because it's between us and God. 
And Jesus even informed us that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you pray, anoint yourself with oil. Basically, what would they do when they anoint themselves with oil? It would brighten up the complexion, complexion so they wouldn't be pale. To, get, to not give off that appearance of lack of food, but rather to give off a healthy, healthy countenance. Jesus informed them, when you fast, do exactly what you do when you pray. Go to your prayer closet. Don't make it known to men. But rather, just keep it to yourself and God. Because your Father which seeth in secret will reward you openly. And don't be prideful when you fast. We have the example of the publican and the hypocrite and the, and the Pharisee who are praying on the corner. It's the exact same concept. The Pharisee prayed openly, loud prayers. He had his reward. Anything we do in this life for the reward and attention of men we have that reward in this life. When we get to heaven, that reward is nothing but hay and stubble because we did not do it with the right motives. So when we pray and when we fast, we do it as unto God and God alone. In all honesty, everything we do in this life should be for God and God alone. Why do we come to church? Hopefully it's not to appease so-and-so or so-and-so -so sees. Or because mom and dad expects us to, or the pastor expects me to, I don't want them to get on my case, or the Sunday school teacher's got to get on my case if I show up. We show up for God. And things will arise in the church, unfortunately. You might have gossips. You might have somebody talking bad about you. But does that stop us from going to church? No, because that's not the reason. We don't do things for unto man, but we do things for unto God. Everything we do in this life, including praying and fasting, is to be done for the glory of God and is to be done for us, for Him, and Him alone. And as I've already said, said when you fast, a fast is not between you and so-and-so, while you and so-and-so can fast together for something and pray. Don't get me wrong. But you're not fasting to get the attention of somebody else. When we fast, it is to get God's attention. Not man's attention. It is to get God's attention. To show him that we're serious about getting a hold of him. That we're serious about whatever issue is pressed upon us. Yes, we have a great high priest which goes before the throne. Who's touched by the feeling of our infirmities. What does that mean? It means he feels exactly what we're feeling. He's been there. He's done that. In our terms and He's bought the tea. What? How does it go? He's been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, t-shirt, and moved on. Even though we have that great high priest that goes to the Father on our behalf, when we fast, it still shows how serious we are about the issue and having God answer however He sees fit. And as we've already said, when it comes to fasting, fasting is not just skipping a meal. That's dieting. But when we fast, we need to replace it with something. Else. And I don't mean by um, something work. And when a woman's fasting, she don't go into the kitchen and cook something up or sew something up or uh, whatever else might be up her alley of interest, collect points, whatever it would be. Same way with the guy, when we fast, we don't go into the wood shop, work on something. But we need to take that time and set it aside specifically for God. Which means when we fast, that time that we normally would be eating, we go and we find ourselves in our prayer closet. That time when we would normally be eating, we go and we find ourselves in the Word of God more. We, re we replace it with spiritual things. Can you replace it by listening to a CD or of someone preaching or uh, Christian music, if it's up, absolutely. But we cannot neglect prayer. Even when we fast, we can read the Word of God, but we still need to pray at some point because prayer is the master key, and prayer is to be coupled with fasting. Well, I should I said it backwards. Fasting should be coupled with prayer. So we can do other things. Now, are we going to get hungry throughout?
that in our past, however long it is. Yes, we might get hungry. In those times throughout the day when we're not normally going to be eating, or we got to get hungry. Yes, we might get hungry, especially within the first three days. But if you have the opportunity, when you start getting hungry, find yourself in the prayer closet. Find yourself reading the Word of God. And the Holy Ghost will quench that hunger. Will it go away for the entire day? Probably not. The first three days are always the hardest. But when we find ourselves in a place of prayer, it makes all the difference. When we looked at time frames when it comes to fasting, there is no place in the Bible that says you must fast for a certain number of days. It's all over across the board when it comes to the number of days that people have fasted in the Bible. There's been one day, there's been two days, there's been three days. There's been four days, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. Moses and Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights if you want to get ambitious. There's no time frame. But whatever time frame you choose, you've made a vow between you and God. And you need to keep that vow. If you decide that you're going to fast for three days, you need to keep that vow. God expects us to keep a vow. He said, better is it for a man to keep a vow than to break it. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 23, 21, and 22, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee. And if it would be sin in thee, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. Ecclesiastes 5, 4, and 5. When thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed, Better is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay it. So when we make a when we decide on the time frame of our fast, we made a vow to God, and we need to keep it. And there are all different kinds of fasts. We, there are individual fasts. You can fast as a couple, or you can fast as a group. There is no wrong way to fast. Like I said, yes, Jesus said, when you uh, fast, not to make it known unto God. But if you're fasting as a group for the same reason, there is nothing wrong with that. You just don't need to go blabbing it all over like this valley. Or if you and uh, someone else in the church decide to fast, fast you don't need to go um, blabbing it to the entire church. That's between you guys and God. Not to make it known unto men, but make it known unto God. We have examples in the Bible of people fasted by themselves. Of course, we've already said that Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Does anybody know uh, where he was when he was fasting? He was on Mount Sinai. What was he doing on Mount Sinai? He was talking with God. He was in the presence of God. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights on top of Mount Sinai while talking to God and receiving the law. More than one time. I know two for sure, brother. I don't remember off the top of my head. And why was he alone? Because everybody was terrified of God. They didn't want to come near the mountain. It was covered in smoke. Would there have been maybe a a uh, nation fast day, or nation, a whole nation that fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? I couldn't tell you. But Moses fasted by himself. When Jesus went into the wilderness, there was not another human being with him. He fasted by himself for 40 days and 40 nights. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, we find a woman on her face that the priest thought she was drunk. But she was fasting and praying for her son. And let's, let me, on a side note here, this woman's fast and her prayers, if they played a part in it, gave us the greatest prophet that Israel has probably ever seen for the most part. 
Because when you think of what the first prophet, it was Samuel. When everyone else, when the Levitical priesthood went awry in Israel, and they could not be trusted because they were bringing sin into the temple and everything else, God rose up a man to lead them all, and that was Samuel. And his office did not end by the hand of God, but it ended at the hand of man because they wanted a king like everybody else. One woman's prayers and fasting for a son gave the Israel nation one of the greatest godly men in their history. There could be couples fasting. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 through 5. The wife has not power over her own body, body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband has not power over his body, but the wife. Defy ye not the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together, that same tempt you not for your incontinuity. There could be groups of facts. Like I said, did Israel miss out on a giant national fast period? I don't know. But I do know of one wicked city in the history of the world that they took time to pray and fast. And that was Nineveh. If someone would please read Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5. Jonah 3 and verse 5. So the entire city put on sackcloth and ashes and fasted. This wicked city that God wanted to destroy. He sent Jonah with that message. That reluctant prophet that didn't want to go. The entire city fasted. When we look at a fast, there are several different ways that we can fast. What's the typical type of fast? No food. And what do we drink? Water. We don't normally drink soda. We don't normally drink Pepsi. We don't normally drink Coke. We say, I don't like Pepsi. We don't typically drink juice. It's just no food and just drinking water. That is the typical fast. Is there any other type of fast that's wrong? There are several different types of fast. There's also the absolute fast, which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 9 and verse 18. If someone please find Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, and also verse 18. So Moses did not eat, he did not drink. So there is the complete fast where there is absolutely nothing. It is in this fast here that we see that it was truly a fast unto God. How do we know that? Because your average person cannot last more than three days without water. Your body needs it. I think the average Food consumption is no more than three weeks, which is 21 days. For a person to pray and fast with no food, no water for 40 days or 40 nights, it is truly a godly fast. So there's the absolute fast. We see that Esther and the nation of Israel did the same type of fast when she prayed, uh, sent out a petition for everyone to fast for their country. 
We find the same fasting in Acts chapter 9, 9, Acts 27, 33, and also Ezra 10 and verse 6. So there's the normal fast, which is the eating, uh, no eating, but the drinking of water. There's the complete fast, which is no food, no water. And just as a side note, when we fast, there are physical benefits to what to it as well. There really are. If we don't eat anything and we drink water, well then the water's gonna flush out all the toxins and the chemicals in our bodies. There are physical benefits to it, but we don't fast for the physical benefits of it. We fast for the fit for the spiritual aspect of it. Because there are athletes that will fast, they'll skip no food and maybe just water for the physical aspect of it. But they don't do it for the spiritual. But when we do it, we do it for the spiritual. There's also a juice fast. I believe that's found in the book of Daniel, if I remember correctly. You can fast all day with only a small meal in the evening with just enough to survive. I know a gentleman that did that for 32 days, I think it was, 37 days, something like that. Where no food the entire day, but at the night you just have just a handful of food just to keep your body alive and going. There are all kinds of fats. What are the results of fasting? John Wesley tells us in his journal of a similar kind of deliverance in 1756. The king of Britain called for a day of solemn prayer and fasting because of a threatened invasion of the French. Wesley wrote that the fast day was a glorious day such as London had scarce seen the, restora seen the restoration. Every church in the city was more than full and a solemn seriousness sat on every face. Surely God heareth prayer and there will yet be a lengthening of our tranquility. Then in a footnote he added later, humility was turned into national rejoicing for the threat invasion by the French was averted. When we fast, we have no idea how God's going to respond. But we can be assured that heaven took notice. What does the Bible say when it comes to prayer? The kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and it's the violent who take it by force. Not those that go to the gates and kind of wonder what God's going to do, but the violent take it by force. When we pray and we fast, we storm the gates of heaven, and we take it by force. And we keep pounding on the doors, even if it does not seem like we get an answer. God even told us in his word to keep on knocking, keep persevering. What did he say about the unjust judge and the widow woman? Not because I fear God, but because this woman troubles me day in and day out, I will grant her petition. When we pray and we fast, we show heaven how serious we are about receiving an answer. And those that attack the gates of heaven through prayer and fasting will receive an answer one way or the other. To deny the flesh of its natural desires may cause us to be more in tune to hear the voice of the Lord, but it also places us in a realm more easily and prone to attack to the enemy. So don't think that just because we pray and we fast and we are becoming spiritual that we're not going to be attacked. You know who the enemy attacks, whether it be physical or spiritual? They don't attack the person in the corner that they don't see. They attack the prominent person. They attack the prominent country. They attack those that are going to be a violent threat. And the enemy does exactly the same thing. How do we know that? Because he gave us insight into his word. The devil pays attention to those who are battling his kingdom. What did the what did Legion say to Jesus? What are you, thou son of how is it? Son of God, what are you here to torment us before our time? They knew who Jesus was. 
Why? Because he was attacking their kingdom. He was coming against them. What did the demons who were there and the man possessed say to the seven sons of Sceva? They mentioned people that they knew were attacking their kingdom. And they knew them by name. Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? You haven't been bothered enough.